Hello, everyone. Happy New Year. You are listening to the Rue Time and Clades. My name is Joan. And I'm Albert. And we are back with our third roundup special for 2022. Um, so we're going to be taking some stories that we thought were particularly fascinating th from throughout the year. And we'll do a little rundown about some of the discoveries that were made, um, as well as going to our usual news uh, stories that we like to cover. Um, of course, it has been a little while since we've done a news episode. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be covering stories from October through December of 2022. And uh, we'll go into more detail with those later. But uh, before we do that, uh, Albert, how have you been? How was your New Year's? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um... I would say it was pretty good. Uh, so I actually spent a couple weeks in Taiwan uh, with my family, and uh, you know it, it's always it's always good to be back and see family after a long time away. Um, so that went well. Uh, we actually went birding quite a bit. There are lots of interesting birds in Taiwan, and we saw quite a few interesting species. But uh, yeah, now I am back in England and uh, kind of resuming research mostly. Uh, I'm basically still wrapping up a, a project I've been working on, uh, starting like during my PhD. So, uh, yeah, just uh, slowly plugging away at that. Um, but in the meantime, I guess I can mention that uh, in between the last time we uploaded an episode and now, uh, a paper I co-authored was published. So that's a uh, that's always fun. Um, so this was a paper that was led by my lab mate, Juan Benito. Uh, he started his PhD at, at the same time as I did, and we also graduated at basically the same time. And now we are both uh, postdocs in, in the same lab together. Uh, so yeah, I, I've been working with him for, for a long time. And um, he basically got like his biggest chapter out of his PhD published, but um, I, I helped a little bit with that, so I'm one of the co-authors. And what we did with this paper was that we described the postcranial skeleton, and that, that means like the skeleton other than the skull, so everything behind the head, um, of Ichthyornis, which is a very close relative to modern birds that lived during the Cretaceous. It would have looked a lot like a modern bird, uh, essentially, except for the fact that it had teeth. And uh, Ichthyornis has been known for a long time, since the 19th century, but there has been relatively limited study done on like its detailed anatomy especially now you know a couple centuries on uh, we know so much more about uh, the various um, different species that were in that part of the tree because many, many different new species of like these near modern birds have been discovered and uh, no one has done a really kind of detailed um, comparison between ichthyornis and these newly discovered forms um, so based on 40 specimens that had not been described before, uh, we basically did a very detailed kind of description of all the features in the postcranial skeleton of Ichthyornis and uh, compared them to modern birds, compared them to other near modern bird, uh, but not quite modern bird like dinosaurs. Uh, we, we hope that this, uh, this information, because we, even, even though Ichthyornis has been known for a long time, we actually were able to kind of uncover quite a bit of new information about its anatomy. Um, we hope that this new information will um, help future researchers understand the origins of modern bird features better because, again, th this was something that was very much like a modern bird in nearly all respects. So, uh, yeah, if you want to know when certain modern bird features evolved, Ichthyornis is a very important uh, taxon to look at. And so, yeah, that was that. It was a super long paper. Um, I'll be sure to link it in the description. Um, but uh, we are definitely very glad that it's, it's been published. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, it's always good to follow up on these sorts of findings to really flesh out the early history of birds. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to learning more about that over time. Um, as far as what I was doing for New Year's, um, I actually went to Florida to see some folks. Um, it had been, I wouldn't say a while, but it had been a couple, I mean, at least a year since we had been. Mm. And, uh, of course, you would think, oh, Florida for Christmas. Well, that must be, you know, balmy and nice. Mm. And yeah, it was for a little bit, but we actually had some seriously cold weather. Mm. Mm. Um, I think it was, I think it reached like 22 degrees Fahrenheit on like Christmas Day. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was like, oh, you know, we, we, <laughs> we had yeah. to bundle up. Um, but Florida's nice because uh, they have a pretty good bird scene as well. Um, I like seeing the sandhill cranes mm. and the 
all the different wading birds and the ibises and uh i really enjoyed that and it was good to just catch up with the folks again as mm -hmm. well um we did that went and saw my sister in charlotte and then we came back home and uh yeah we you know we've still been doing stuff for the house um this is that month january that's going to be uh the power down so to speak as we finish everything and then hopefully move in by february um so <laughs> mm -hmm. this long ride of telling you all about this house since we started the show <laughs> um is, is coming to a close finally and uh lots of thoughts lots of thoughts mm -hmm. on that um but uh, the big thing i've been excited about is i've been catching up with a lot of reading that i've been wanting to do um i finally started riley black's new book the last days of the dinosaurs um and patrick roberts jungle which had been on my eye for a while and so i'm currently working through those and uh i think we'll most likely be hearing more about those in a later episode of the show i wouldn't mind doing small reviews for those because uh, they're really excellent so far i've been quite enjoying mm -hmm. them um also got to read persepolis for the first time that was nice and, and that new uh <laughs> that new dinosaur manga um dinosaur sanctuary uh. which uh, was quite popular for a while on the interwebs um it's a bit tropey, but it's fun. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of nice to just have something like that to begin with. Um, it's clear that the people behind that manga really care about dinosaurs mm. and paleontology. And, and they put a really great product out there. So that's really been like what I've been up to. Um, it's been a good New Year's. And uh, I'm just glad to be back again to do more episodes of the show. And uh, i got to say, we really um, picked some good stories for you all today. Um, now, as... As we should specify, um, because it's been a while since we've done a news episode and as well as, you know, a roundup episode, we wanted to do something just a little bit different for a change. So in regards to the roundup episodes, where we usually cover a story in about two to three minutes and then move on to the next one, um, we've settled for five for each of us. So I'll do five stories, Albert. We'll do five stories and we'll alternate, of course, taking turns. Um, but then we're going to be also doing our new stories for October, November and December. Um, but because that's quite a few months to tell big stories like this, and we want to try to constrain our time a little bit, <laughs> even though we know you all like our long episodes, um, we're only going to be doing one per month. So I'll do an October story. Albert will do an October story and then we'll go from there. So that's kind of what you should be expecting for this episode today. Um, but before we do that, uh, we have some little shout outs that we would like to give. So uh, Albert, unless you have anything else you'd like to add, would you like to get started? Uh, yeah, we can go to the next slide, but uh, I think uh, you're actually up first, I believe. All right, yeah. Um, so like, this isn't really like up to the minute news, but this is something fun that I discovered a, a couple months back that I really wanted to share and highlight. Um, so. Uh, if you can make out this interesting image here on the right, that is a poster of the last 5,000 years of human history. So this individual here, this is Arjun Uyas. Um, he is from Kerala, and he is a science teacher uh, that's involved with the Cambridge University. Um, and he got the inspiration to make this large poster from his brother. Uh, who shared with him a world history poster that was made by Oxford. And some of you have probably seen this poster. This is what this this one here is based on. Um, and it was, to put it politely, not great. Um, there were very many parts of the world that were underrepresented or just ignored completely. And so having seen so many other fairly poorly done and incomplete world history posters, and there are quite a few of them out there, uh, Arjun decided to make his own. And so much of his research focused on well-studied but relatively unknown societies and cultures to non-specialists, uh, particularly in regions like India or Sub-Saharan Africa or the Americas, uh, especially during the time prior to colonization by Europeans. And this ended up taking 13 months to put together. Mm. Um, and so it was actually released in January of last year. So this is about a year old now. Um, and when I discovered this a couple months back, uh, <laughs> it was a sight to behold. Mm. That's for sure. It is amazing. Um, now, if this chart 
seems difficult to read. It's honestly pretty easy once you get your bearings. So the y-axis shows different regions of the world and they're color coded. So you have like Central and East Asia or Europe, um, while the x-axis shows time over the past 5,000 years. So this is from 3000 BC to roughly the present day. Um, so like you can see a part of the world like South Asia, where it starts with the Indus Valley cultures and then past the movements of the Indo-Aryans and then on and on to the Vedics and the Buddhists and the Muslim societies until you get to present day India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And you can do that for basically any country in the world today with this poster. Um, in fact, even the layout was planned mathematically to account for equal representation with geography. So a lot of these like other older world history posters, they tend to kind of overemphasize some parts of the world for others. Um, whereas in here, you know, each space is in approximate appropriate size. So like China and India, for example, are appropriately big hmm. compared to something like say the British Isles. Um, now I've actually been in contact with Arjun Uyas for the past couple of months. And this was over Instagram and he has made the poster available for anybody who would like to snoop at it especially in more detail like he has a large file that you can click on but if you really want to get all the little itty bitty um texts because there's quite a few of them mm. um you can pay him 20 bucks through his dms and he'll send you a high quality pdf that you can print at your convenience um but as i understand it not only is he working on a proper website to sell this poster, he's already working on a revised second edition that should be sent to release this month, um, at least. And uh, I'm currently excited because uh, I went and bought one and I decided to wait for the second edition. Um, it's supposed to be even more massive than this. <laughs> um, <laughs> like this poster itself, if you were to buy it as it was, uh, he recommends 90 by 90 centimeters or 35.4 by 35.4 feet, you know, for Yankees like me. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I wanted to give a little bit of a shout out to this because um, I haven't been hearing much about it recently. Um, maybe it kind of had its day and, and, and kind of went into internet obscurity as so much often does. Um, but I'm really impressed with this. Um, it is certainly without a doubt the best world history poster ever available. Um, and I want more people to be aware with it, uh, aware of it, and uh, support Arjun. So this is kind of a little shout out to you. Hmm. Um, and uh, we will be posting appropriate links to learn more about this poster and also like contact Arjun uh, in the description. So uh, yeah, Albert, do you have any thoughts? I mean, what can I say? This looks incredibly impressive. <laughs> and I mean, that, that's even underselling it. Uh, yeah. I'm sure this uh, this is a fantastic resource, and definitely, I, I think anyone who is interested in world history um, should probably consider getting a copy. Because yeah, that that looks amazing. Yeah, and it's even like kind of coded a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So like, there's little symbols that tell you like when the Iron Age starts for different parts of the world, or like when people start making pottery in certain parts of the world. Um, and there's also like little lines that show like migrations and, and population expansions, for example, and they kind of interconnect between the different spaces. So it's really like integrated, which explains why it kind of looks like a, a Jackson Pollock painting a little bit. <laughs> but um, no, it's a uh, it's amazing. And uh, I'm excited to uh, to see my new version for sure. And I'm sure a lot of you probably will, too, if you decide to go forward. Um, but yeah, so that's um, Arjun Ulyas' History of the World poster. Um, now, Albert, I do believe your shout-out is next on the next slide. Uh, yes, so I also have something to shout-out to, because um, in the meantime, again, uh, between the last time we uploaded and now, uh, this new book came out, published by Lynx Editions, uh, which is well-known for its field guides covering modern birds, but uh, now they've come out with a new book on birds of the Mesozoic. So uh, these are extinct birds, um, but presented in a field guide style. Um, so of course, uh, a lot of the life appearance of extinct birds um, is speculative, but uh, the underlying anatomy is all based on the actual fossil material that we have 
of these birds. So it's uh, it's sort of a it's a fun look, hypothetical, I guess. Like if you could go out in the Mesozoic, how might you be able to recognize uh, some of these species that um, we currently know only from fossils? Um, and uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, books on you know paleontology might uh, be reminded of a similar book that came out. Uh, about 10 years ago, actually, which was uh, titled very similarly. It was titled A Field Guide to Mesozoic Birds and Other Winged Dinosaurs by um, mm -hmm. very skilled paleo artist Matt Martiniak. Um, so Matt Martiniak did not write this book, but in, in a way, uh, this book is kind of inspired by that one. It's a sort of a spiritual successor because it's been 10 years since that other one, and uh, we've found many, many more species of Mesozoic uh, birds and bird-like dinosaurs. Um, so uh, yeah, this is kind of, sort, of, sort of an update to that, even though it's uh, by a different publisher and different authors. Um, now, one of the main reasons I'm giving a shout out to this book uh, is not only because I'm interested in the subject matter, but also because of who the author is. And so the author of this book is Juan Benito, uh, whereas Rock Olive is the illustrator. Um, so Juan Benito uh, was the lab mate who I mentioned earlier, who had published that big paper I, um, that I'm also on uh, regarding Ichthyornis. And in fact, uh, Ichthyornis is the, um, the kind of cover image of this book here. Um, so yeah, Juan has been working on this book um, at the same time as he was working on his PhD, which is incredibly impressive. Uh, and it's not something I would ever recommend anyone else do, because <laughs> uh, having seen the amount of work that was necessary uh, to bring this book into fruition, yeah, it, uh, it, it was a lot. It was a lot. So I'm very, very glad to see this out at last. Um, and I, I guess uh, another reason I'm highlighting this book is not only to promote the work of my lab mate, uh, but also because I, I might have had a small hand in this book too. Uh, so mm -hmm. basically throughout um, the production of this book, uh, Juan actually was, I guess you could say, con consulting me for a lot of the information inside. So um, I, I kind of looked over the contents of the book and uh, I, I looked at all the illustrations before they were uh, you know, uh, finalized. And uh, I also uh, kind of, you know, kept track of what studies were out there on, on all these different fossil birds and shared them with Juan as appropriate. Uh, so yeah, in, in, a, in a way, I, I, I kind of contributed to the production of this book myself, even though I, I was not the one who wrote the, the actual text in it. Um, and indeed, if you uh, get a copy of this book and flip to the acknowledgments page, uh, there is a pretty large section of a paragraph where uh, Juan uh, was gracious enough to uh, thank me quite quite extensively. So um, yeah, I, I'm I'm very grateful for that. And in, in fact, he has also given me a free copy of the book in addition. So yeah, I, it, it it looks really good. Like just just seeing the um, the draft manuscript on a computer uh, doesn't really prepare you for exactly how it's going to look as as a hard copy. Uh, but it's a, it's a really nice compact book. It really is uh, formatted and sized similarly to how uh, a field guide to modern birds uh, would be. And so I think this would be of great interest to um, you know anyone who has uh, tried to speculate or imagine what these fossil birds might have been like in life. And not only that, but it also provides a lot of background information too about all these different types of birds. So uh, if you're not familiar with Mesozoic birds, but you want a good overview, uh, this is definitely a pretty good book to get. And so, yeah, that's uh, my shout out. What do you think? Oh, that's exciting. Um, I love things like this. Um, I'm very curious though. So I know um, the older book you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, Birds and Other Winged Dinosaurs, right. uh, that covered I think Panoraptora. That's right. Lineage. Yeah, yeah. What's this one do? Yeah. So the uh, the scope is a little bit different from from uh, Martiniak's uh, 2012 book. Uh, so you're right. Yeah, the um, Field Guide to Birds and Other Winged Dinosaurs by Matt Martiniak that came out in 2012. Uh, that one covered all um, dinosaurs with uh, wings in the broad sense, you could say. So uh, with large elongated broad feathers on their forelimbs forming a planar kind of wing structure um, and not all, all those species we think uh, were able to fly probably these wing-like structures originated uh, before flight was actually a thing in these uh, bird-like dinosaurs um, so that one covered not only uh, birds and their immediate relatives but also uh, troodontids, dromaeosaurids 
and oviraptorosaurs. Um, so this one is meant to be a bit narrower in scope. So this one only covers the group Aviale. Um, so classically, this is the lineage that in popular kind of science communication tends to be called birds. Um, and so that, that's what they're going with here. So Aviale is a lineage um, of anything that's more closely related to uh, modern birds than to uh, uh, dromaeosaurids and troodontids. So th this book doesn't include the dromaeosaurids and troodontids, but it includes Mesozoic representatives of the modern bird group as well as anything closer to them than the uh, uh, dromaeosaurids and troodontids. So yeah, it's a, basically, it's really a field guide to Mesozoic avialids, you could say, if you want to be technical. Oh, sure. I totally get that. Um, <laughs> so is Archaeopteryx in here? Yep, it is. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, and I mean, I know Lynx Editions. I mean, my gosh, we, I could say a lot about Lynx Editions because mm -hmm. um, when I was at East Carolina, they had both Birds of the World and Mammals of the World. Oh, yeah. The, the large, giant, um, I don't know what I would call them, survey encyclopedias, in a sense. Right. Like, I mean, they, they were richly extensive like they were like they were part field guides mm -hmm. because each volume had plates that's right with like all the then known representatives of each group but then you had these huge essay sections that basically included just about everything that we knew about the different lineages mm -hmm. so like you want to learn about elephants well this is like the best place to go because right, right. you get the etymology you get the evolutionary history so they, they did include a lot of that um all the sorts of behavioral studies that have been done observations field studies um, captive um, information uh, conservation updates uh, it was really amazing to see and i certainly spent quite a lot of time just browsing a small section of these books at a time mm -hmm. because they're like um i mean they're bricks they're yeah. like huge cinder blocks of books um and so like to know that Lynx also has been kind of doing smaller field guides using a lot of these illustrations because i mean once you've illustrated like say all the birds of the world <laughs> right. you can pretty much use those for anything you want mm -hmm. at that point um so it's kind of cool to see that they've started to branch out now and they're doing uh, fossil species. Right. Um, as I understand, this is, I think this is like the first sort of book in that range, I would think. I think for so, like yeah. Fossil animals. Mm -hmm. um, so, hey, fingers crossed that if this is successful, and I'm sure it will be, um, that maybe we'll see other forms of life covered. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> with that same sort of care and attention that they've given to the living birds mm -hmm. and mammals so that's exciting yeah congratulations to all of you um it certainly looks like a wonderful book so now uh we're gonna move on to our 2022 roundup mm -hmm. so again these are five stories that each of us have chosen that are sort of highlights of the past year of, of different discoveries that we thought were really fascinating and, and neat to talk about mm -hmm. um, and so again, this is a little bit different from what we usually do because for these, we tend to do 10 stories each and we um, would alternate between those. But here we're just doing five each, yeah. um, but the same sort of gist. So uh, uh, Albert, I believe your first story is up, if I'm, if I'm yes, correct. Yes, I, I think so. Yeah, so we can head there. Uh, but before I uh, start the clock on this story, I'm just gonna uh, mention a little bit about my approach to choosing stories this year. Um, so in previous years, when I've done these kind of quick roundup uh, stories, I've mostly picked uh, essentially what I thought were highlights of the year regarding uh, research into uh, birds and their close relatives, so uh, birds and other manoraptor and dinosaurs. Um, and so I, I did something kind of similar this year because all the stories I picked were about birds, but I set myself a, another kind of um, requirement, essentially, and that was that I would not talk about any story that I had already talked about before on this show, uh, whereas in previous years, um, I've sometimes kind of uh, reused stories, essentially, and uh, you might remember this. Uh, sometimes I'll say, oh, if you want to learn more about this story, you can uh, go back to one of our previous episodes, and I'll, talk, I'll have talked about it in more detail there. But uh, this year, because we just did that um, uh, Dinosaurs the Second Chapter update special, uh, I figured that if I actually did pick 
what I considered to be the absolute highlights uh, in Nanoraptorin research over the past year, I, I feared that it would overlap very heavily with the update special we just did, because I, I already talked about a lot of the major discoveries um, in that episode. So uh, I decided instead to pick stories uh, that I had not talked about yet. So in, in a way, uh, these are essentially interesting stories about birds that I noticed uh, during the past year, but I didn't have uh, a chance to talk about on the show before. So now is my opportunity to do that. So I, I guess that's, that's just to preface how, how I chose uh, my stories. Uh, but yeah, now, now we can dive in uh, to the stories themselves. And so my first story is about uh, plumage color diversity in hummingbirds. And this is a very interesting uh, story because as you probably know, hummingbirds are incredibly colorful and you can just see a small sampling of the color diversity in hummingbirds um, on the left here, a series of, of photos. So uh, this study wanted to quantify, okay, exactly how colorful are hummingbirds anyway? And so what they did was that they took samples of um, you know, colors found in hummingbird feathers and then they plotted them out onto these graphs you could see on the um, uh, on the right, and really uh, all these different um, kind of these separate graphs are really the same graph but viewed in different directions or in different ways. And so, what this is is uh, basically a representation of where where on the light spectrum these uh, colors fall. Um, and it's a tetrahedral shape because it takes into account how birds view the world. Um, so birds have four different color receptors in, uh, most of the time, whereas we only have three. Uh, so birds have four different color receptors that are sensitive to different wavelengths of light. And so the way a bird sees color is not necessarily going to be the way that we see um, the same kind of color, you could say, or at least a, the color of the same object that we, that we perceive is not necessarily going to be the same. And so they decide to reflect like how birds would actually see uh, these colors uh, in their study is that uh, is potentially more significant to the birds themselves. And what uh, you can see um, regarding the different colors of the data points here, uh, in black are uh, colors that are sampled from other birds that aren't hummingbirds, whereas in gray, these huge mass of, of dots um, are all colors that they sampled from hummingbirds. And so what this shows is that including hummingbirds actually extends the range of colors that we see in bird feathers by quite a lot. And so in a way, this is basically saying that hummingbirds exhibit such diverse colors that some of them are not even found in other types of birds. And so uh, in a sense, you could say that they basically shown that hummingbirds are indeed the most colorful birds um, out there. That being said, there are some other colorful bird groups that have not been sampled so extensively. So things like parrots, for example, or uh, the birds of paradise. So uh, it is possible that uh, if those groups are also sampled as extensively as they've done for hummingbirds in this study, uh, we might also see a further expansion of the kind of color spectrum uh, exhibited by birds. Um, but yeah, this is, a, this is a pretty cool study that basically shows uh, in a sort of uh, quantitative way that uh, hummingbirds are, are very, very colorful. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I, I would think that something like passerines would probably be a close second, at least, mm. considering how many there are and factoring in like the birds of paradise, for example. Um, but yeah, I mean, like that's, it's fascinating that we can quantify something like this now, just in terms of color diversity in a group of organisms. Um, and hummingbirds are just fantastic mm -hmm. too in themselves. So that's really neat. Um, we'll move on now to uh, my first story. Mm -hmm. um, and this is kind of a, a first for the show as well, because we haven't really covered fungi before on the show, at least not by themselves. Uh, you might recall Albert's talk on the fungal spore dispersal of the tapaculos mm -hmm. back in our October 2021 episode. Um, but in terms of their evolution and diversity, there is certainly a lot that could be said. Um, yeah. This paper by Thomas J. Smith and Philip C. J. Donahue from October uh, attempts to answer some questions regarding phenotypic disparity or the measure of morphological range within an organism's lineage. When we think of fungi, we usually picture mushrooms and toadstools, but these are only the fruiting bodies of much smaller organisms mm. that live in the soil. And the group also includes things like molds and mildews, yeasts, 
um, as well as part of what makes lichens as they form a relationship with an algae species. Um, the team found out that out of the tens of thousands of fungi species that are known, there were really only four distinct morphotypes. And that's all based on their mode of reproduction that characterize them all. So there are flagellated forms that will move about freely, kind of like sperm. Um, there are zygomacetous forms, which use special thick-walled spores during their reproductive stage. Um, there's the sac fungi, or the ASCII, uh, which form these special little cups that hold their spores. Um, and then the club fungi, which is where we get the charismatic mushroom shapes that release the spores to the wind. Hmm. Now, the divergences between these morphotypes was determined to be the result of previous extinction events. So despite the exclusion of fungal fossils in the study, um, which is a relative difficulty to find anyways, um, the phylogenetic sequence of living taxa overlaid across geologic time seemed to support that conclusion. Hmm. So in a hypothetical scenario, should an abundance of fungal fossils be unearthed, and then added to data like this, there would likely be significantly more overlap between these four morphotypes than it's currently seen. Um, but nonetheless, some interesting observations can be made. For example, in regards to multicellular fungi, like the sac and the club forms that you can see here in the bottom uh, left two uh, squares, um, these lineages show several periods of episodic punctuation across geologic time, which is similar to what we see in animal life. And here the authors suggest that regardless of being a fungus or an animal, perhaps multicellular life might have undergone a common process of descent. And so I thought that, that was really neat to highlight. Um, certainly this is probably a bigger story than I should have covered for <laughs> a short uh, highlights reel, but I think this is a good taste of what the fungal world has to offer. Mm -hmm. um, Albert, what do you think? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, fun fungi are definitely something uh, that I, I'd like to learn more about, but it's uh, it, they they have such a daunting kind of diversity, uh, but they they are fascinating, and uh, it is really cool to see studies like this, like focused on kind of their broad evolutionary patterns and uh, trying to figure out exactly how they achieve that diversity. So this is definitely cool. Yeah, I agree with you there. All right, so I guess we could go on to uh, my next story. Um, so this one. Uh, wanted to look at the uh, relationship between flightlessness and brain morphology in a group of uh, mostly water-associated birds called rails. Um, and uh, this one is pretty interesting because uh, I think in general uh, there there's a pretty strong interest, uh, at least in ornithological circles, uh, regarding the relationship between kind of brain anatomy and flight. Like uh, you know, almost everything about a bird's anatomy is so heavily modified for flight and uh, is often thought that the brain of birds has to have been also heavily modified uh, to be able to, you know, process all of, all the things that need to be processed uh, during flying. And to a large extent, that is true. Um, but then that also raises a question, what happens when a bird stops flying, like uh, when they become flightless? Um, are there any consistent changes in the brain structure? And in some cases, people have suggested that, well, maybe in flightless birds, uh, the brain becomes relatively smaller than in flying birds, because uh, maybe they don't need as much of that uh, processing power, you could say. Or maybe uh, flightless birds have lower metabolism, so they, they can't sustain as big of a brain. Um, however, other studies have suggested that there is no strong correlation between kind of brain size and flightlessness. And so this um, study decided to investigate the relationship specifically in rails. And rails are a great case study for this because rails, uh, as you might know, if you followed uh, Dinosaurs, the second chapter, our series on bird evolution, um, they have become flightless many, many times, as in dozens of times at least. Um, and so they have become flightless independently a huge amount of times. And so if you want to study kind of convergent evolution, of flightlessness and what that does to a bird's body, rails are a great group to study. Um, the authors of the study, they basically took a number of different measurements from the skull 
and the brain of, uh, of different rail species, both flighted and flightless, and tried to see if they could find any consistent patterns. And what they found was that contrary to some previous suggestions, uh, flightless rails actually tend to have bigger brains than the flying ones. And that's pretty interesting. And the author suggests that this might be because, uh, because um, flightless rails do not have to devote as much of their energy, essentially, or their resources to building big flight muscles and can instead devote more energy to having big brains. And that's also interesting because um, the only rails that are known to use tools, uh, in fact, the only species of rail that has been confirmed to use tools is the flightless Okinawa rail from Japan. So they'll use uh, stones to break uh, open snail shells so they can eat the snails inside. And so the author suggests that maybe becoming flightless, allowing for this bigger brain, actually promotes the evolution of tool use in rails. Now, of course, since we only have one species confirmed to use tools, it's pretty difficult to confirm this hypothesis. But they do point out that uh, the ecology of many different types of flightless rails are not that well understood. So perhaps future observations uh, will show that there are indeed other um, instances of tool use among these many different species of flightless rails. So um, rails are pretty secretive and hard to study too, and I'm sure that doesn't help. So yeah, uh, that definitely makes for a very interesting uh, line of inquiry. Uh, do you have anything else to add to this? Um, not much, but I will say that it is interesting to consider something like a rail to be a tool user. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, usually when we think about tool use in birds, we immediately go to the more conventionally understood intelligent right. quote unquote groups, you know, the parrots and the corvids. Mm -hmm. um, it may, maybe it's because they're so secretive because <laughs> they're using tools. They have like little underground societies. <laughs> like they've solved the energy crisis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, no, like this is incredibly fascinating. And definitely this is an area of biology that I would certainly like to know more about mm -hmm. in terms of like the relationship between um, brain anatomy and function in different organisms, yeah. for example, uh, flightlessness in various bird groups. Um, so that's really neat to see. That's a great study. Um, so we'll move on to my my second story. Um, so stem arthropods, like mm -hmm. the famously weird opabinia, uh, are typically thought of as animals of the Cambrian period, mm -hmm. with their fossils well preserved at sites like the British Shale in Canada. For the most part, it has been generally thought that these funky stem arthropods died out by the end of the Cambrian. But we now have good evidence that many of them actually survived for at least a little bit longer. Uh, take, for example, the recently described uh, large filter feeding Agirocassus that actually lived during the early Ordovician. And there were also related forms that existed until the early Devonian. So they had quite a bit of a range on them. The focus of this November study by Stephen Pates and colleagues is a brand new fossil species from this assemblage of stem arthropods. And it too is a survivor of the Cambrian. So we'd like to introduce a uh, Meridian Bonnier from the Middle Ordovician Gilwern Volcanic Formation of Powes, UK. So it's only 13 millimeters long as most of these stem arthropods were, were actually shrimps. Um, a meridian very closely resembles the aforementioned opabinia and its kind, termed opabinids. Uh, though the phylogenetic analysis performed for the paper did not recover them within that group. Uh, instead, as you can see in the chart to the left, they seem to be a related lineage hmm. that sported similar features. Of uh, special interest here is the protocerebral appendage that hangs from under the head and is used for catching prey items. Uh, in the fossil image here at the right, you can see the kind of the outline reconstruction in image B, uh, that little pink flappy looking <laughs> thing there, that's what this organ is. Um, Meridian allies with more derived forms like the anomalo caridids that are also very well known in that its organ sports dorsal spines along its length, which you can also see here in the image. Uh, they're kind of poking out to the left there. Based on aspects of its anatomy, the authors argue that over geologic time, perhaps these downward hanging appendages may have undergone a number of changes. Ancestrally, they may have been fused with the mouth, as in animals like Opabinia and Meridian, uh, with the anomalocaridids being a more derived form that shifted for paired appendages. 
And so on the main stem of this uh, panarthropod lineage, these fused appendages would see a reduction in eventual loss as we reach the crown group, which includes things like insects and arachnids, mm. for example. Um, now, this is the major hypothesis that the paper posits, but given the lack of genetic data to add further support, again, this is we're, de we're dealing with really old fossils here, um, the authors do suggest that perhaps an alternative model can be suggested, um, which actually does group Merida urine with the opabinids mm. as a member of that lineage, which would then make this whole thing with the protocerebral appendage uh, a novel feature in that clade that has nothing to do with the main line of stem arthropod evolution. Um, certainly more fossils we need to confirm or deny mm. either model. But at least it gives us an interesting idea that the ancestors of such familiar animals as insects may have undergone their own weird and wacky transformations <laughs> before standardizing themselves to what we see today. Mm -hmm. so that's really fascinating. It's always good to see a new fossil species. Uh, what do you think, Albert? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I remember seeing uh, th this paper come out and uh, yeah, it's, it's an incredible find, especially uh, just the, the fact that one of these so-called uh, Cambrian weirdos basically sort of survived um, past the Cambrian, uh, that, that's a pretty big deal. Um, and it, it is always fascinating to find out more about the, uh, the animals occupying this part of, of the tree of life, because um, not only are they incredibly weird, but uh, they also, like you said, shed light on the potential origins of very familiar species that are alive today. Um, so yeah, this is uh, definitely worthy of uh, being part of this highlights reel. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, uh, so let's see my next story. Um, so we're going to talk about brains again for this one. This is a coincidence. Um, but um, this, uh, this study looked at um, a particular species of bird of prey called the letter-winged kite. It comes from Australia. And uh, the letter-winged kite is unusual among the excipitromorphs, which if you recall, uh, potentially from Dinosaurs the Second Chapter, is the lineage that includes vultures, hawks, and eagles, but not falcons. Um, the letter-winged kite is unusual among the excipitromorphs in that it is nocturnal. It actually hunts at night quite a lot, uh, whereas almost all the other species um, in this big group of birds of prey um, are largely diurnal, active during the day. And so a new study examined the anatomy of its skull, uh, especially um, kind of the region around its eyeballs, um, as well as its brain structure to uh, figure out if there were any kind of um, clear adaptations in, this, in these regions um, for nocturnality compared to other types of accipitromorph raptors. And uh, what they found was, perhaps surprisingly, uh, not really. Uh, there wasn't much uh, consistent difference uh, between the letter-winged kite and diurnal um, raptors to suggest um, that it had specific kind of adaptations, at least in skull shape and brain shape, um, for its kind of nocturnal behavior. Um, that being said, uh, it is still possible that um, it's got some, you know, adaptations in the specific setup of its nervous system, for example. Um, so things that would not be uh, directly reflected in the kind of bony anatomy or the simple shape of the brain alone. Um, so that possibility can't really be ruled out. But it is, uh, it is quite interesting that basically this study is showing that you can become a nocturnal um, animal without kind of the corresponding modifications in at least the, this kind of gross morphological uh, scale. Um, so that's definitely quite, a, quite an interesting find. And I mean, le the letter-winged kite is a, is a really interesting species in general. So I was really um, excited to see kind of a new study being done uh, focused on its anatomy. Yeah, I'm actually very curious um, since they didn't find any differences between the diurnal and the nocturnal anatomy of the brain, at least so far in this study. I wonder if that implies that the letter wing kite may have been relatively recent in becoming nocturnal and there mm. hasn't been enough time for those sorts of adaptations to take hold. Yeah, um, that would not surprise me at all. And uh, yeah, I would, I would say there's probably a pretty good chance that that's the case. Yeah, that's incredibly fascinating. Um, alrighty, um, so my third paper. Uh, so this is 
probably one of the larger paleontology stories mm. of 2022. Um, certainly when it came out, I saw it all over the place on the interwebs. Um, and that's especially considering the subject material. So the origin of pterosaurs has always been shrouded in some mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're pretty confident that they're archosaurs, very closely related to the dinosaurs, sure. But we don't have a really good sequence of fossils showing how the pterosaur body plan with its weird elongated fingers and big wings uh, came about. Um, you know, we, we don't have something in the same way that we do for birds. We have a pretty good idea of where you know, the bird body plan came from across the dinosaur line. Um, you know, there's, there's no Archaeopteryx of pterosaurs, as I, as I like to say. Mm, right. So anything we can get is sure to be a big help. And one major clue was the 2020 discovery that the Lagerpetids, a group of Triassic reptiles, were pterosauromorphs on the line leading to pterosaurs. And that's actually a finding that we covered in our first Roundup special, mm -hmm. incidentally. Um, and another clue concerns this paper by David Fafa and colleagues from October on a little animal called Scleromoclus tayloride. Now, this animal has been argued in the past to be a close relative of pterosaurs since at least the late 90s. And while the fossil material has been fairly good, there were still details missing in the skeleton mm. that led to different phylogenetic interpretations. So some studies also found it to be a dinosaur morph, so on the line leading to dinosaurs. Um, as well as a possibility that they were equally related to both the dinosaurs and the pterosaurs, so a little bit of an older line going back. So this paper highlights some new fossils that had been CT scanned, and they reveal all sorts of these missing details that paleontologists had been looking for. And these are enough to build for the first time a complete skeletal model of Scleromoculus, so much so that it could be viewed in three dimensions, as you can see in the image here at the top right. So by plugging the data into a phylogeny with other archosaurs, the team was able to strongly support a close relationship with the pterosaur line archosaurs. Um, but unfortunately, not to any exact degree. So I made a simplified tree here uh, to the left, and this shows what I'm talking about. Um, different anatomical characters suggest that either Scleromoclus belongs with the Lagerpetids, or they are a sister to the pterosaurs, or they're in a group that's allied to both. Um, with much better fossils, you know, we can now also say some things with more confidence about what the more immediate ancestors of pterosaurs behaved like. Um, and the paper found them to be digitigrade, uh, running animals mm -hmm. that were mainly quadrupedal, but had the potential for some bipedal locomotion. Um, and they would have been partially fluffy, too. And so we have Gary Liguito's one of the illustration here at the bottom right to kind of illustrate them, what they would have looked like in mm -hmm. life. Uh, cute little things. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is similar to the Lagerpedids, but neither show any real adaptations or pre-adaptations towards the powered flight of pterosaurs mm -hmm. that a lot of paleontologists have been looking for. So perhaps we need to look uh, further forwards in time for the right kind of fossils. Um, so we kind of have a ways to go before we can answer those sorts of questions. But this study is certainly a great start. Yeah. Um, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Scleromoclus has been such a mystery animal for for so long. It's been debated so heavily that um, such a detailed study that provides so much new information about it, uh, it is very valuable indeed. And uh, I definitely think that what they have found seems very plausible uh, given what we know about it for now. Um, so, yeah, de definitely excited to, to see the study, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll find out more about it in, in the future. Yeah, hopefully. All right, so my next story is about uh, a very unusual kind of adaptation in a group of birds called the Tetyrids, um, which is a group of birds that you've probably never heard of unless you're very familiar with uh, birds of the American tropics. Um, but these are a group of uh, passerine birds, and... Uh, some of the species uh, among the Tetyrids are very unusual, as you can see on this um, slide. And in particular, they don't look especially unusual when they're adults, but when they are juveniles, 
they exhibit some pretty strange uh, anatomical features. So in the top left um, is a baby tetyrid, um, a, a chick of a species called the Cenarius mourner, and it's got these very long kind of orange downy feathers all over it. And this turns out that it kind of closely resembles um, on the uh, top right here, uh, a species of toxic caterpillar that lives in the same environment as it does. So it is very likely that these baby birds are uh, kind of have an appearance similar to these caterpillars um, that aren't very good to eat uh, as a defense against predators. And uh, furthermore, there are also some species in the tetyrid group, um, as seen on the lower left here, um, that seem to mimic other types of things, such as, um, in this case, what the authors propose is that they might mimic um, kind of these hairy looking fungi that grow in the same environment. So in this case, it's not so much the fungi are uh, nasty to eat, but more that uh, so that they don't look like something that's good to eat for something that likes to eat baby birds. So it's basically pretending to be an inedible object. Um, and so these are definitely very unusual adaptations among baby birds. Uh, there aren't many kind of uh, juvenile birds that exhibit such extreme um, uh, features to avoid predation. And so this new study, um, as seen on the next slide, uh, decided to look at the features of different uh, species of tetyrids to try and see um, how this kind of uh, mimicry might have e evolved. And what they found was that in the group that contains all of these mimicking species, uh, you can see it's kind of highlighted and shaded in a gray box here, um, in the larger lineage, uh, including these species as well as their closest relatives, um, there are already some, you could say, pre-adaptations towards this kind of um, adaptation uh, evolving, uh, namely the fact that, uh, first of all, a lot of these um, species all have very elongated down instead of being born uh, naked, uh, like some other uh, passerine birds are. And um, oftentimes, uh, these uh, these babies uh, also don't beg for food as often as uh, most baby birds do. Uh, so they spend a lot of their time just sitting still um, in the nest. And speaking of the nest, uh, all these species nest in what we call the cup nest structure. Um, and so this is the typical kind of bird nest that you would imagine when you think of a bird nest, um, as opposed to, say, a, a globular nest or a domed nest where there, there's like a roof on top and it's shaped like a ball with an entrance on, on the side or on the bottom. Um, and so the authors suggest that probably uh, the origin of using the cup nest in this lineage uh, probably exposed the young more to predators and therefore required them to um, kind of evolve these adaptations to avoid predation. And furthermore, uh, this might have started by uh, basically simply reducing begging for food um, so that uh, they did not draw as much attention to themselves to begin with. And having the elongated down meant that that could also be further modified into these extreme types of mimicry so that they mimic, uh, you know, toxic caterpillars or fungi. And so finally we see these very extreme morphologies in this one specific lineage. Um, so yeah, a really interesting study on a very unusual uh, type of uh, uh, bird behavior. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think it's really fascinating that we essentially have like a roadmap to understanding how these mimicry behaviors came about mm -hmm. across this lineage of birds. Um, and I just think it's, it's a really great like defense strategy yeah <laughs> um like I'm, I'm not gonna go around eating caterpillars but <laughs> when i see the fuzzy ones i always kind of yeah give them a distance exactly so I, it certainly makes perfect sense that baby birds like this could um utilize that same sort of um defense for themselves and it uh, seems to be fairly successful mm -hmm. um, that is incredibly fascinating so let's move on to our next paper here and uh, this is kind of a fun one um viewers who have been with us for quite a while at least since our our old show um incidents and reflections may recall an event that we participated in back in june of 2020 called dino nerds for black lives mm. where we hosted a great sweep of paleontologists who presented on their work while raising money and awareness for various charities like black lives matter and a national bailout. And one of those talks was hosted by Clint Boyd regarding hadrosaur mummies. Mm -hmm. And a notable aspect about this talk 
was that some of the content was actually embargoed because it was unpublished, which is the etiquette for scientific papers. But we fast forward to now, or more specifically, last October, and now we can talk about it. <laughs> so uh, Boyd joins a paper uh, with Stephanie K. Drummeller and colleagues uh, to discuss the hadrosaur mummy known formally as NDGS 2000, but is nicknamed Dakota, having come from the Hell Creek Formation of North Dakota. So Dakota is an Edmontosaurus, one of the hadrosaurs, um, and is referred to as a mummy because of the remarkable preservation of the skin and tissues around the skeleton. Now, of course, this isn't true mummification, like Egyptian style, um, obviously, but it is instead the result of special burial processes that preserved organic matter before it could be fully decomposed. Now, it had been originally thought that the Dakota mummy was preserved in the typical way for many specimens like this, being rapidly buried by sediments soon following death. But a closer inspection of the remains seems to have contradicted this interpretation. For example, you know, as can be seen in the photographs to the right, there are tear marks on the skin and puncture marks on the bones, as well as what looks like desiccation on parts of the body and little areas where small insects have burrowed into it, um, which had suggested that this carcass had actually been kind of lingering for a while and actually dried out a bit prior to being preserved in this manner. So what's going on here? Well, a closer inspection to all of these points allowed the authors of this paper to propose a new model for how the Hatchasaur mummy Dakota was saved into the future. So first, the animal seems to have actually been laid out for weeks to months, exposed to the usual processes of decay but with some light scavenging, uh, and of course the body would blow up and then deflate around the bones and the muscles, which explains some of the uh, shrink wrapping look of some of these skin impressions to the bones. Um, in fact, in regards to the scavenging, besides the presence of small insects actually burrowing into the skin and whittling away at the soft bits while leaving the, the scales un, really undisturbed, um, the tooth marks were discovered to have come from crocodilomorphs. And in fact, there was one that actually dragged on the skin a bit. Mm. And that can be detected in the mummy itself. So a little bit of uh, alligator feeding behavior, well, alligator-like feeding behavior uh, that's actually detectable in, in a fossil like this, which mm. is amazing. Um, and of course, it was after all of this that the body became buried and preserved. And there's a very detailed illustration sequence to the far left of this slide that the authors provide, which kind of gives a brief rundown about what happened to Dakota before being buried. Um, so studies like this are important in that they suggest that there is actually no one path to creating mummified dinosaur specimens mm. like this, as had been originally presumed. Um, and so when it comes to learning about dinosaur mummies, researchers should really consider multiple models that don't just include the rapid burial that had been previously used to explain something like this. Yeah. So I think that's a very important highlight for sure. Um, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, I definitely agree. And um, th this, is, this was a really exciting study to see come out because the specimen Dakota had been known for a very long time, for many years, that you can find lots of like news articles and press uh, about this specimen going back many years. However, uh, it had largely remained essentially undescribed in the scientific literature. So to see like anything uh, like peer reviewed come out on it uh, is, is a really big deal. This work is just so detailed regarding kind of one of the most interesting things about this specimen um, that it, it's just incredible. And I'm really glad that we, we know more about the, uh, the preservation um, and fossilization history of the specimen. And like you said, yeah, it, um, it, in some ways what they found is pretty counterintuitive because a lot of time we would have assumed that uh, something such uh, exquisite preservation would have required very rapid burial shortly after death. But what they found is that this is not necessarily the case. And so this is definitely a very significant find in more ways than one. 
Alrighty, so I think this is the last uh, roundup story uh, I picked. And so this is about another group of uh, neotropical passerines called the mannequins. Um, and uh, mannequins are quite, quite a special little group of birds. Uh, a lot of the time, the males in this group are very colorful. And they do all these kinds of amazing courtship displays. Uh, in a way, I, I think um, they could be seen as perhaps like the birds of paradise of the neotropics. Uh, they're, they're not closely related to birds of paradise beyond being passerines. But uh, they, they have a very kind of similar um, courtship strategy where the males invest a lot in very fancy looking displays to try and mate with as many females as possible and try to attract as many females as possible and just play no part in um, kind of parental care. Um, which is very similar to what Birds of Paradise do and probably owes um, to the uh, kind of productivity of the tropical habitat that they live in. There's lots of fruit to eat all year round. And so that's why this kind of, a, you know, very interesting reproductive strategy can be sustained. Um, and so it turns out that a lot of mannequins have very interesting sexual dimorphism in size. Um, and... Uh, in some cases, the males are bigger, uh, but in other cases, the females are bigger. And so this new study decided to investigate what might drive these types of differences. And they found something quite interesting. And so what they found was that they first they plotted out body size of the different sexes of these birds, um, of different species of mannequins, um, and then tried to correlate uh, these size patterns with different aspects of their lifestyle. And they found that in the species where the males are smaller than the females, it turns out um, they tend to be the species where they have the most acrobatic displays. And so on the graph here, they're showing kind of the diversity of mannequins that they looked at on the bottom. Um, and the, the graph on top with the data points uh, is showing different types of measurements that they took. But the key one to look at in this case are the blue dots, which reflect a body mass. And... In species where the males are smaller, uh, the blue dots fall below the dotted line, uh, whereas in species where the uh, males are bigger than the females, the blue dots fall above the dotted line. And, and it turns out that in the species that fall below the dotted line where the males are smaller, uh, these also happen to be, the, tend to be at least, the most acrobatic um, uh, species during their courtship displays. So their courtship displays, when the males are displaying, when they're doing their courtship dances, uh, they often involve things like jumping into the air or like flying in a certain type of uh, pattern. Um, and uh, so it turns out that having more acrobatic courtship displays drives smaller body size in these birds. And that makes a lot of sense because uh, if you are smaller, then you can become more agile, uh, all other things being equal. And so probably um, becoming smaller has allowed males to uh, um, perform ever more uh, acrobatic courtship displays, which the females in these species seem, seem to like. And so a very interesting um, kind of driver of sexual dimorphism in this group of birds. Um, do you have anything to add? Well, I think it's interesting to see studies like this mm -hmm. because, yeah, as you said, like it's it's one of those things where if you were to just kind of conjecture like, oh, the smaller bodied males would be the most agile and right. that attracts, like yeah, it would make sense. But it's certainly much better to actually have the data mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. back that up, right. to be sure. Because, of course, nature is under no obligation to follow our, <laughs> you know, our conventions and what makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um that's really neat to see that something like dancing behaviors can influence the body size of various birds mm -hmm. like this. Um, yeah, mannequins are great. Um, yeah. I think that's the same one. There was that British show from a couple of years back where they had the voices over all the animals. That's and right. The one mannequin doing the Michael Jackson dance. Yes. <laughs> uh, they're fun to watch. They're amazing little birds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's great. Um, and hey, speaking of birds, um, my last roundup study mm. covers birds, um, more specifically our, our good friend, the chicken. Yeah. Um, so it, it seems as though we've been following the quest to understand the origin and domestication of chickens since early on in this <laughs> series, <laughs> at least since our first roundup episode. Um, that earlier study uh, by Ming Shan Wang and colleagues had argued that the red jungle fowl was domesticated somewhere in Southeast Asia or Southern China 
after 7500 BC, based on their analysis of living individuals and their DNA. And so they would have emerged prior to the introduction of the rice and millet farming cultures in that part of the world. Now, we did lightly criticize that paper for not including archaeological specimens. So it was pleasant to see a new study by Joris Peters and colleagues from back in June that did just that. Mm -hmm. So the team examined zooarchaeological remains, because that's the technical term when you find animal bones among human remains. Um, they examined chickens from over 600 sites across Africa, Eurasia, and Oceania, uh, tracing not just the oldest known individuals, but their journey of dispersal across the world. And so their story of chicken domestication becomes a little bit different from that prior model. Mm. Uh, Peters and colleagues argue that the chicken wasn't domesticated until much later, mm. sometime between 1650 and 1250 BC. So far later than many other domestic animals that are familiar around the world, like cattle and sheep. Uh, and while they do seem to confirm a Southeast Asian origin, they place it within the context of the Neolithic rice and millet farming cultures after all. Uh, in fact, they even argue that it was the presence of such grains that maybe drew chickens into human settlements mm. where they were noticed and then reared. Um, and it was, of course, from such settlements that chickens spread out first across China and India and Mesopotamia during the later half of the second millennium BC, which through trade routes brought them to places like Greece and Rome and Ethiopia. Now, of course, in true scientific fashion, uh, this paper brought some comments, mm -hmm. notably from Min Sheng Peng and colleagues who argued that the study neglected some crucial older archeological sites in China and Mongolia. They argue that there is actually substantial overlap between China and Southeast Asia that would necessitate an earlier origin for domestic chickens, perhaps more in Southern China, uh, where rice farming actually originated. And the original authors of this paper actually had a response to them. And they said that they neglected those Chinese sites because they did not meet all the criteria to represent honest to goodness domestic chickens hmm. because proper analyses hadn't been done on those sites yet to actually say that they were domestic birds or if they were say wild birds right um, so they wanted to wait until the data was clear um, but they don't deny that earlier chicken remains will probably be found that might once again change the story or add new details. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's safe to say that you better believe we're going to be there to cover that. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> what do you think, Albert? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's always very cool to see, like, new pieces of, of this puzzle being put together, uh, even if some of them uh, might contradict each other in, in areas. But, yeah, I mean, it, it's a fascinating story. Um, chickens are definitely not just some of the most um, intimately kind of... Uh, well, birds that are most intimately associated to us, uh, but probably, you know, animals that are most intimately associated with, with us in general. Uh, so, yeah, any, anything that helps us understand how that relationship came to be, um, I, I think it's it's pretty special. And this this one certainly has, uh, you know, it, it definitely proposes some, some pretty, pretty bold claims, but, you know, I, I, I don't think they're necessarily implausible. Yeah, and like there's certainly a possibility that maybe we're having so much trouble because it was a complicated mm, event. Right. I mean, we talked about dog domestication before or like the domestication of cattle uh, where it's been proposed that there were actually multiple domestication events right. with levels of interbreeding in various ways. So maybe it's going to turn out that that's what happened with the chicken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, certainly would be interesting to see for sure. Um but yeah, no, it's, it's always good to, to see studies like this. And uh, hopefully there'll be like a big one that combines all this data together and, and we can actually get somewhere with this. Yeah. So uh, I believe that is it for our 2022 Roundup episodes, uh, or Roundup stories, I should say. Um, so now we're going to move on to our usual news stories mm -hmm. uh, for October, November, and December. Now, again, I must stress that because of the interest in time, we have each picked one story from each month to cover. So again, Albert will have one from October, I'll have one from October, and then we'll move on to November from there. 
So, uh, Albert, I do believe you have the first pick for our October news stories. All right. Yeah. Let's uh, go on to that slide. And, oh, well, it's, it's another bird story. <laughs> well, <laughs> well um, I, I promise you this is the last bird story I'll cover in this episode. Um, but, uh, yeah, so for my October story, I decided to pick this study, um, looking at the informativeness of ornaments in male and female birds, um, which is an interesting topic because it is being increasingly recognized, as you might know, um, potentially uh, you might have heard of it uh, from Dinosaurs the Second Chapter, that uh, in many species of birds, um, both the males and females have kind of ornamentation on them. Like uh, maybe they, they're both colorful or they both have uh, structures for display. Um, and both the males and females will use these ornaments to assess the, the quality of potential mates. Um, which is quite contrary to kind of the standard uh, traditional view that, oh, it's, it's only the males that, that display or only the males that have ornamentation. And while that is true in some species, it's far from universal. And indeed, uh, we now think it's actually very common uh, that uh, both sexes have ornaments in many species. Um, but, uh, well, we you know, don't, don't really have a comprehensive understanding of is whether or not these ornaments um, are equally informative for both male and female birds. And so the authors of this study essentially did a big survey of previous studies that have been done on these uh, mutually ornamented birds, so birds where both the males and females are ornamented. And uh, they looked at studies essentially um, testing to see whether these ornaments are actual signals of, say, body condition, so how healthy a bird is, or fitness, so that is essentially um, how successful a bird is at reproducing. Um, and what they found was that in previous studies, pretty much across the board, uh, it turns out that ornaments are equally informative in for both male and female birds. So uh, say, the, for example, the brightness of the color in uh, both male and female birds of the same species um, is is an equally good indicator uh, of say how healthy or how reproductively successful um, an individual is, regardless of its sex. And this is true even in cases where the ornaments are not as elaborate uh, in the females. And so, what does that mean? So, well, uh, you can you might be able to uh, find some examples on the uh, figure here. Uh, so, the this is a phylogeny of the um, the different species uh, that were the subject of the studies that were surveyed uh, by the authors, um, as well as like um, basically what factors uh, in body condition or fitness um, their ornaments uh, reflect. And so you can see on here at the bottom, uh, a mallard duck is pictured. And you're probably familiar uh, if you've uh, spent any time looking at mallards, uh, especially wild ones, that the males and females look very different. Um, however, both male and female mallards are ornamented, uh, even though the males are a lot more brightly colored. If you look carefully, both males and females have these sort of iridescent uh, patches on their wings, uh, this kind of bluish uh, patch on the wing. Uh, and if you've never noticed that before, you can take a look next time you see a wild mallard. Um, so uh, it turns out that uh, basically the quality of this iridescent patch um, it's equally informative in both male and female mallards, even though females are, don't, uh, aren't as colorful in their overall plumage compared to the males. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I thought this was a very interesting study um, that kind of builds on a kind of not, not necessarily newly recognized concept, but a concept that's being increasingly recognized as being important, uh, that of mutual kind of sexual selection, you could say, um, or at least mutual signaling. And so, uh, yeah, I, I thought this was a, this was a pretty, pretty cool um, kind of broad scale study um, on this topic. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I agree. And uh, it definitely reminds me of, I know this, the, the, I wouldn't, I don't know if issue is the right word, but it's a big concern in biology at the mm -hmm. moment that there has been a neglect in study regarding the female of various species yeah. versus the males, um, particularly when it comes to like museum collections, uh, where often it's because the males of like birds, for example, are so brightly colored 
and, and intricate in their designs, as has been um, you know, argued in the past, mm-hmm. that they often are like the favored specimens for collections and study versus the females, yeah. which tend to be very drab. Um, so it's kind of refreshing to see a study like this that actually twists that interpretation a little bit mm-hmm. by showing that just because they may not be as brightly colored as the males, many of the female birds are actually, you know, fairly elaborate in their in their feather plumage um, to certain degrees. Yeah. And that this is actually just as important in their behavior and biology as the males are, mm-hmm. uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, it certainly does. And so it's kind of neat to see that. Um, because, yeah, like, if, if you really think about it, a lot of these birds, um, like I'll, I'll use the mallard example, because um, uh, I'm certainly familiar with seeing them. Uh, they're kind of everywhere mm-hmm. here. Um, uh, but the females, I mean, like, they have, like, you know, the fairly spotted coats, and, and um, this can, can range various shades of, like, brown and, and orange. And I think that's that's particularly pretty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm even like as along with you know the male of the species which of course is just, just so iconic yeah uh, with, that, with that green head um so it's really neat to see this and uh i certainly would look forward to, to more studies in this vein um maybe with other species that have this sort of sexual dichromatism mm-hmm. yeah so let's move on to uh, my october story mm-hmm. so this one was kind of a fun surprise uh and if there's, if there's something about vertebrate life that is well known to both researchers and non-specialists alike, it is the wide range of sounds that so many kinds of these animals produce when communicating with each other. Um, from the mating calls of birds to the tiny squeaks produced by alligator hatchlings that alert their parents, mm. uh, from the chorus of frog croaks to the songs of baleen whales, mm. uh, there seems to be no limit to the ways vertebrates speak acoustically. Now, the literature on such behaviors is immense, but there is one area that has long puzzled scientists. When did the capabilities of acoustic communication come into being? And where in the vertebrate family tree can we trace its origin? Now, it has been previously argued, based on the available evidence that has been studied, that acoustic communication is a case of convergent evolution among vertebrates, having originated multiple times across different unrelated lineages. And this seemed to be supported by the various unique anatomies in both vocal tract anatomy and the ears of different groups. But other studies have argued for a common ancestry for this trait showing that parts of the hindbrain that play a role in acoustic communication have a shared anatomy among vertebrates. Not to mention that, as the foundational physical source of vocalization, all vertebrates, or at least all the choanate groups, so that's the four-limbed tetrapods, as well as the lungfishes, rely on their lungs. Mm. And a major problem with the former interpretation is that these studies have often failed to include key groups of vertebrates that could support or reject a model of acoustic convergence. And that's where Gabriel Jorwich Cohen and colleagues come in. They decided to draw attention to these missing groups that were not often included because it was assumed that they couldn't produce vocalizations Mm -hmm. for communication. And these included the turtles or testudines, uh, the New Zealand twitara, which is a relative of lizards and the last survivor of its lineage, the sphenodonts. The Sicilians, those strange legless amphibians which inhabit moist tropical regions, and the lungfishes, which are the lobe fin fishes most closely related to the tetrapods, which make up the choanate Mm. clade. Um, So in this study, the team looked at 50 species of turtles within most of their major subgroups, so they included things like soft-shelled turtles and sea turtles, tortoises, side-neck turtles, for example. Um, and they had one species of Sicilian and one species of lungfish, the South American type. Um, and of course, the Trotara is represented by only a single species, mm-hmm. although it was once argued to be two. So Jorwich Cohen and colleagues gathered their own recordings for these different groups in captivity using special underwater noise monitors 
and sensitive air recorders, and they made sure to gather separate recordings for males and females, different life stages, and during the day and during the night. And to cover their bases some more, uh, they even recorded ambient noise when the animals weren't present, mm. so that way they could make sure they recognized which sounds were natural or not. And they also combed the scientific literature on these animals to see if there was any info that could be used that hasn't really been featured in a study like this before. Um, but in order to tailor their study, they did make sure to determine that any sounds produced between animals were for intraspecific communication mm. solely. So they didn't include things like hissing in snakes. Uh, and they then plugged all of this into a phylogeny, which can be seen to the right here, with some photos of representative groups. Now, despite the general impression that things like turtles didn't communicate acoustically, George Cohen and colleagues actually uncovered evidence for every single species they chose to examine. Wow. Uh, and they recovered quite a number of sounds. And in fact, they included these recordings in the supplementary data. And because this paper is open access, you can check them out yourselves. And their dives into the scientific literature found support or acoustic communication for many other conventionally mute animals. So things like salamanders, certain types of lizards. Um, one notable example they highlight is the African lungfish, mm. which apparently is able to perceive sounds both underwater and in the air. Mm. And another key note was that eight out of the 10 salamander lineages and four out of the 10 Sicilian lineages produced sounds for communication. And uh, some turtle species were found to produce over 15 kinds of calls, even in situations of parental care. Mm, yeah. So far from being quiet animals of the undergrowth in the swamps, uh, the lungfishes, Sicilian salamanders, and turtles seem to be fairly chatty. <laughs> now, because of the widespread presence of acoustic communication in all of these chelonate vertebrates, the, routine, the, the team's results seem to favor the hypothesis that this ability was a homologous trait, having stemmed from at least before the common ancestor of this clade, which would make it over 407 million years old, so back in the Devonian period. Now, as stated previously, the presence of lungs seems to be a key factor in acoustic communication of a vocal sort. Uh, even though researchers have learned that the ray-finned fishes which make up the majority of fish that we know about today. Um, they can communicate acoustically, but these are mainly produced through, say, the fish rubbing their bones together right. or contracting certain muscles in their swim bladder. Now, the swim bladder is an organ with a common ancestry to the lung, mm -hmm. um, but it does function differently because you know they're, they're in a marine or freshwater environment most of their lives. Um, so there is a possibility that maybe there's even a link here, which would then push, which would then push back acoustics even further in time. Mm. But uh, that's a story for another day and for another study. Now, moving forward in time, uh, the team state that the larynx is very important for tetrapod communication mm -hmm. and that most acoustics are produced via it, uh, even something like the shrinks of birds though a different embryological origin than the larynx, works in the same way and is still powered by the lungs. Uh, and again, as stated before, there is an additional case to be made for a homologous origin in the shared features of the hindbrain in choanate vertebrates, particularly the location of the motor neurons responsible for these sorts of behaviors. So this study is definitely a highlight for sure, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and its inclusion of previously neglected taxa should be a wise lesson, I think, for all researchers to make sure your bases are covered <laughs> when testing hypotheses like yeah. these, because you never know if there are missing puzzle pieces. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is this looks really impressive. Um, and yeah, it's it, it, it definitely is a, is a pretty special study. I, I like the like you kind of alluded to, the, the classic model has been that among tetrapods, we, we have vocal communication in, 
in archosaurs, so the crocodilians and birds, in mammals, and also in frogs, and then everything else is more or less silent, um, where with like rare exceptions here and there. Um, and we've known for a while that's that's not strictly true, because I, I had heard before about some of these vocalizations made by turtles, for example. Um, I, I'd seen uh, some years back uh, various studies looking at um, vocalizations made by, um, I, I think they're called uh, giant South American river turtles. Um, and mm. I, and I, I think um, that uh, that might be one of the examples you, you referenced uh, regarding things like parental care, like the, the babies and the adults who actually uh, make vocalizations to communicate with each other. Um, but like e even that, it, it could well have been sort of a one-off exception. Um, but to see here um, so many kind of underrepresented uh, groups, at least in, in this field of study, um, being sampled and then all of them turning out to actually be vocal. That's, yeah, that, I, I don't think I necessarily would have expected that. Um, like, yeah, I, I, I don't think I necessarily would have expected Sicilians or, or lungfishes um, to, to make vocalizations to any like notable extent. Um, so yeah, this is a, this is a really, um, interesting and, and in some ways I, I would say pretty surprising um, study and it the implications are uh, quite quite intriguing uh, to say the least um, so I, I I really enjoyed reading about this study too um, kind of a kind of a tangent here but um, this reminded me like just now when you were talking about it that last year um, the paleontologist Matt Bonin who, who was not involved in this study as far as I know um, released a music album yeah so he kind of, kind of a, as a hobby i suppose um, he released a music ob album um uh, where all the songs in the album are about the evolution of hearing in um, in animals well mo mostly invertebrates um and of course uh, vocal communication is is kind of very closely related to that topic and so in in the album he has a song about uh, frog communication for example and he has one about the evolution of hearing in mammals and one about um kind of vocalizations in birds and so uh it, it is kind of funny that it came out at the same time uh, during the same year um, that this study came out um so of course in the um in the album more emphasis is put on the traditionally um kind of vocal groups that are that have been previously been recognized with um, at least we can say perhaps that they they have um especially complex kind of vocalizations um but may, maybe in the future he he will need to release a sequel um kind of covering all these underrepresented uh, vocalizers too um so yeah the, that that's a that, that's a kind of kind of fun um side note um to, to bring up and I'll, I'll be sure to put a link to to his album in the um, in the description because you can listen to it and purchase um, uh, recordings of it uh, online so yeah <laughs> yeah that's definitely interesting um <laughs> that, is, that is actually that's funny to, to hear um unfortunately and I, I should have done this before we recorded but I didn't I haven't actually gone to this the supplementary material yet to hear what these vocalizations sounded like mm -hmm. So like I'm very I'm very curious like what a Sicilian right sounds like or like what a lungfish sounds yeah. like because yeah again like I have really no frame of reference for animals like this because mm -hmm. like with frogs like I mean it's very clear how they how they make their sounds yep. and, and they're very audible animals but um it's interesting to consider these the the, the implications of this because especially going back into deep time um, right in many books that i have read about geologic time where they summarize the history of the earth there's always a line somewhere about the silent forest oh yeah right like before the archosaurs and the frogs came about um like the forests were mostly quiet um even before they were like insects for example that mm -hmm. could make those sorts of sounds but with the studies like this showing perhaps a much early origin for acoustics um maybe that needs to be shifted a bit mm -hmm. maybe there's a possibility that all of these big temnospondyls and and these early tetrapods that we know about so well and, and, and their ancestors like Pictolic, um maybe there was you know quite a chorus going on in those devonian and carboniferous swamps um it's a fun possibility to think about for sure um i mean i'm just very happy for the researchers that 
<laughs> they went out to do the study and they pick all these different species mm -hmm. and like for every single one they got something right. that they were looking for <laughs> like how often does that happen <laughs> um it's amazing it's amazing so yeah I de i'm definitely curious to see more about this especially that link with ray fin fishes because mm, yes i definitely remember hearing about that um recently that it turns out that fish are actually pretty chatty as well oh yeah um, uh, there are the famous recordings that i know have been shared around a couple of times of like coral reef fish that's right and you hear all like the clacking and the chittering and the chirping and that that's all the fish making those noises yeah it's like wow what a <laughs> what an unexpected thing yeah you know <laughs> I, I think in i think it was in uh, blue planet 2 during the uh, clownfish sequence um like you could hear them like like chatting and I, I remember when the episode was first released some people were like oh maybe, maybe that's just like sound effects that they kind of put in in post-production or something but when when you get to like I, I think it was the, the final episode of the series where they talk about like conservation um of the ocean uh they they bring the clownfish back again they talk about the vocalizations made by clownfish and how that's being affected by like anthropogenic noises and then you realize oh the, the, those that kind of interesting i don't know like kind of uh clattery noises um that that you heard during that sequence were, those are the actual calls of the clownfish and yeah that's de definitely not something you usually think about when you think about a lot of these fishes yeah it's, it's incredible and uh yeah the the, the world is singing <laughs> in a sense um so uh that's it for october now we move into November, and uh, Albert, once again, you have first dibs for the month. <laughs> Alrighty, uh, so this is an interesting study on uh, animal behavior. We we do quite like to cover like interesting stories about animal behavior. I think um, so. This this is a pretty cool one. Um, so in this study, um, the authors basically documented uh, previously um, unrecognized um, interactions between two species of carnivorous mammals from southern Africa. Um, so these are interactions between a type of small fox called the Cape Fox and as well as a um, relative to weasels called uh, the striped polecat. Um, now the striped polecat also has another uh, common name, the Zorilla, and in fact uh, this is the, um, the common name that I tended to to know better when I was little. In fact, when uh, you know when I was reading my books about animals, I I, I think I, I encountered the name Zorilla more often than I did striped polecat. But in, in recent years, striped polecat seems to have come into uh, more mainstream uh, use. And uh, I'm not sure what the story behind that is, but uh, well, I'll, I might as well go with it. Um, something pretty interesting about the striped polecat. Um, is that it looks a lot like a skunk. Um, so you might not be able to make it out so clearly in these images here because the, the striped polecat is the animal that's kind of uh, half hidden in a, in a burrow here. Uh, but it's got a black and white kind of color pattern and the, with the kind of white stripes going down its back. So it looks a lot like a skunk. Um, however, it is not that closely related to skunks. So this is an example of convergent evolution. And the reason the striped polecat has evolved uh, this color pattern is probably for the same reason that skunks have, because also kind of convergent with skunks is the fact that the striped polecat has very well-developed uh, musk glands in its anal region. And so when it is threatened by a larger predator, it can kind of squirt a very foul-smelling um, a secretion in, into the predator's face and hopefully drive it away. Um, and so it has a very bold kind of stripey black and white pattern, probably as a warning to other animals that, yeah, you don't want to mess with me because uh, you'll regret it. And so uh, in this um, uh, study, what they found was these two different types of carnivorous mammals uh, were not interested in eating each other so much, uh, but instead uh, they seem to be traveling in association with one another. So uh, the authors uh, collected um, observations. Uh, some of these observations they made themselves, so these were things that they themselves saw, but they also kind of uh, collected observations from uh, park rangers or other researchers um, who had uh, witnessed similar um, events. And so they found that there were multiple observations of these two species, cave foxes and striped polecats, kind of traveling alongside each other. And in the most detailed observation, which was made by uh, two of the um, authors in person, um, 
they found that these two animals uh, not only were traveling alongside each other, but seemed to be um, hunting together. So what they saw was that uh, these animals would follow one another. So one would take the lead and then they would kind of switch off um, eventually uh, until they found a uh, burrow system um, made by small mammals such as uh, ground squirrels, for example. And when this happened, uh, once they found a burrow system, the uh, striped polecat would go ahead into one of the burrows because the striped polecat, uh, being a, a weasel relative, um, it has a kind of very long and slender body, uh, similar to a, to a typical weasel. Um, so uh, it, it's able to kind of slip down into a lot of these burrow systems. And so it would slip down under underground while the fox waited above ground. And then they actually observed, in one case, uh, a small rodent kind of jump out of the burrow or, or dart out of the burrow. Um, and the fox immediately went after the rodent and grabbed it. Um, but shortly afterward, um, it turns out that a, a different species of fox called the bat-eared fox hanging around nearby um, actually gave an alarm call. And so when this happened, the, the, the cape fox dropped the prey that it had caught and then kind of just just stuck around there in a sort of vigilant posture for a bit. And then the, um, the striped polecat popped out of the burrow. And when it, it too kind of realized, oh, there's, uh, we, we should maybe you know, stay vigilant and look out for danger. Uh, it, that, that's kind of what they did. And so it kind of, kind of stayed uh, half hidden in the burrow uh, while they were kind of just making sure everything um, was all good, all was all clear. Um, and then eventually, the two of the, these two animals, they, they just kind of headed off together um, and left the, the burrow system. Um, the authors did not observe what had happened to the prey item that the fox dropped earlier. Like, did it, did it pick it back up again and eat it or something? We, we don't know. But uh, either way, uh, it, it did manage to catch something successfully. And so it seems very likely that this is a sort of hunting association where the uh, striped polecat uh, hunting underground would drive prey items above ground where the fox could catch it. And potentially, the fox might drive prey items that are staying above ground underground into the burrows where the polecat could probably get it. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a really interesting uh, observation. And in a way, it's not unprecedented because if you are familiar with um, carnivoran behavior, you probably know that very similar interactions have been observed in North America uh, between uh, different but closely related species to these two. Um, so in this case, uh, this would be between uh, coyotes, which are like the cape fox, a type of uh, canid, um, and American badger, which like the striped polecat is a type of mustelid. And they have a very similar kind of relationship. Um, American badgers are very powerful diggers, so they can kind of dig down into burrows and, and chase after um, uh, rodents hiding underground, whereas uh, coyotes are a lot better at kind of running above ground. And so um, they're, they also kind of form these kind of hunting associations where uh, mem members of each of these species will follow each other around until they find um, where prey might be hiding. And then the, the badger will kind of go underground and flush prey out on top. And if, if it runs, runs above ground, it's likely to get caught by the coyote. If it tries to go back underground, it's likely to be caught by the badger, um, uh, which is quite, quite, a, quite an interesting uh, association. Um, and there, there has been some debate as to sort of like how, I guess you could say, um, adaptive or mutualistically beneficial uh, this kind of um, behavior is. Uh, so it, I, I've seen it said that, oh, well, that this is this is not something that, they, like the animals don't deliberately seek each other out or, or something like that. that, that this is more of an opportunistic kind of behavior that, yeah, the, the coyote just happens to hang around when the, the badger is digging underground and catches something or, or that uh, may, maybe like the badger does not actually benefit very much from this kind of association and the, the coyote is kind of coasting off its its efforts or things like that uh, but however I, I i feel like that's um uh in increasingly you recognize not necessarily to be the case because people have definitely seen like these different species uh not just like opportunistically hanging around each other but also uh, like deliberately or like seemingly deliberately just traveling alongside each other and and if you stretch it a little like may maybe even like enjoying each other's company i i'm sure like you might have seen this at some point um a few years ago when uh, a camera trap uh, kind of footage was caught of a, a coyote and a badger like traveling together under an underpass and like the body language of the um 
of a coyote, if you if you know like body language of dogs, it it, it kind of pretty clearly suggests that it's, it's sort of having fun. It, it would actually like like wait for the badger. The badger has much shorter legs and travels slower. It would wait for the badger to catch up, and they would kind of like like go go off, uh, um, like continue on their journey together. Um, and it's it seems that from the fleeting observations that have been made regarding cape foxes and striped polecats, that a very similar relationship has developed between these two species as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, definitely a fascinating bit of behavior. And uh, you know, I, I always I always like um, studies that not only um, look at kind of relatively little known species for which we don't have many. Um, uh, we don't have much knowledge about their behavior, but also like reveals such interesting interactions in the first place. Um, yeah, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's amazing to see this. Um, yeah, I'm definitely fam- I'm definitely familiar with the coyotes and the badgers. Um, I remember reading that quite a bit um, in the past. So to kind of see another example of this with um, similarly related animals right. too, like with, with canids and mustelids. Right, right. <laughs> That's kind of that's kind of fun, um, yeah. These, these instances are always interesting to me because, yeah, they definitely reveal a lot more behavioral complexity for animals like this than most folks would think about. Mm-hmm. Because if you were to look at um, a cape fox and a striped polecat, I mean, and if they're looking for food, well, you would think like, oh, why doesn't the fox just eat the polecat? <laughs> because it's similarly small, but like you really start to think about like the benefits of working together to flush out prey where both of you get to eat and it's relatively like easy to do mm-hmm. in a sense. Um, it makes a lot of sense. I, I, I genuinely wonder what goes on through these animals heads yeah. when they do these pair ups like this, because obviously it's, it's between different species. So that would require an understanding of each other's body movements mm-hmm. in, in a sense. Um, that's really fascinating. And uh, yeah, I will definitely say to your like early early tangent. Um, I definitely remember growing up with Zorilla too. Mm-hmm. I used to see that a lot, especially like when I was really young. I'd get the animals A to Z. Exactly. If you're lucky Zorilla would be the one that ends the book. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know too much about that either. Why that why the name kind of shifted? Because uh, because like you said, a striped polecat is not a polecat. Right. It's its own lineage. Right. So. Right. Yeah, that's weird. Um, but hey, I mean, if that's yeah, like I said, that, if that's what what we're what we're doing, uh, I'll follow along. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's really fascinating. I, I I like this paper quite a bit. Um, is the I know these are photographs. Yeah. Um, but is there like associated footage in the paper? Like, oh. do they have like in motion for this? That that's a good question. I you know, I I, I didn't check, but uh, not that. Not that I, not that I saw at least. Um, yeah, I think most of the observations where where they were, where they actually had like photo documentation, uh, were were still photographs, um, as far as I know. Got it. Okay, because uh, yeah, you reminded me of the of the coyote and badger fo- badger footage, mm-hmm. and uh, that's really fun to watch. Um, and so I'm looking at the photos here, and I'm like, oh, I bet that would have been cool. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> with a little fox bounding around with this with this weasel thing right <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's amazing that's amazing um so i'll move on now to my november story um and this one was kind of a fun surprise oh, for yeah. me <laughs> so in biology and i believe this is probably the first time we've well i would have to go back and check but i think this is probably the first time we'll, we'll really cover this um there's a term called lazarus taxon and uh, it's named after a figure in the gospel of john who Jesus brings back from the dead. So a Lazarus taxon is an organism that was previously thought to be extinct, but has since been found to be alive and well Mm -hmm. all this time. And there is certainly no shortage of examples of this in zoology and botany. Um, The coelacanth is the prime poster child for this, Mm -hmm. uh, having thought to have died out in the end Cretaceous extinction event along with the non-avian dinosaurs but was then fished up off South Africa in 1938. Although local fishers certainly knew about it for longer than this. Uh, Not considered a good fish to eat. So there wasn't wasn't really much buzz about it. Um, But there are other examples. Uh, The Takahe, a large Mm -hmm. flightless relative of rails, which lives in New Zealand, which Albert has certainly talked about. Um, In that case, 
fossil bones were found first, and then just three years later, a live one was found. Um, there's also the bush dog of Brazil and neighboring countries, a um, small social canid that was thought to have died out during the last ice age, mm -hmm. but was discovered alive in 1843. Um, in regards to plants, uh, there's the Don Redwood or Meta Sequoia uh, that grows wild in central China. That conifer was first uncovered as a fossil in 1939 and published in 1941. But then that same year, a botanist had discovered a weird tree in Lishuan County and it was soon realized that the two specimens were the same genus. Um, Albert, do you have any other examples of Lazarus taxa that you might know? Oh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are others. I, like um, the uh, the mountain pygmy possum, I think, is another one. Um, yeah, I, I remember reading a, a post, I, I think probably by Darren Nash, because um, who else, right? <laughs> uh, where it was like uh, mammals that were first known from uh, from fossil specimens. Uh, Lao Nasty's the uh, the Laoshin uh, rock rat, which was uh, not not the species itself uh, first discovered as fossils, but uh, it was the basically the larger the broader lineage that it, it belongs to was first known from the fossil record before being being known uh, in the uh, before being discovered alive, basically, uh, which was quite quite something because previously it had only been known from I, I think like the Miocene at, at the latest. Um, and so, yeah, no, there, there are lots of examples of this for sure. Oh, yeah. And uh, I mean, there's also instances of species that were discovered alive, which were later thought to have gone extinct, right. only to be rediscovered later. Yes. Um, and, and there's quite a few of those in, in the conservation world. Um, so this paper by uh, Paul Valentish Scott and Jeffrey H.R. Goodard provides us with yet another example of a Lazarus taxon. And in this case, it's a mollusk clam, to be precise, uh, belonging to the clade Galomatoidea. Now, these types of bivalves tend to be very secretive and cryptic, even though we've learned about quite a number of species. But we know at least that many of them lived commensally, meaning that they form relationships with other marine organisms where they benefit, while the other doesn't really gain anything from it. Mm -hmm. Like, they're not hurt by it, mm -hmm. but they don't mm -hmm. win anything either. Um, so in the case of the Galeomatoidians, um, these clams will attach themselves onto crustaceans and urchins and jellyfish, or else live in their burrows and homes and, you know, gain some protection or better ease of movement, whereas the other one is just like, oh, I got a clam on me now. Mm -hmm. I guess this is happening. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so one genus of these clams, uh, Simatoya, is very poorly known. And until now, there had only been one species described. That's the Simatoya electilis, found in the rocky coastline of Southern California. In fact, here's what a 1964 paper by Donald Shasky and G. Bruce Campbell, no, not the actor, um, with a very greatly amusing title, New and Otherwise Interesting Species of Mollusks from Guaymas, Sonora, Mexico, has to say about it. Specimens were found buried in muddy sand under rocks 10 meters below the surface. And that's about it, mm -hmm. save for some discourse about whether its old genus name, uh, Crinomargo, should be considered invalid or not. Right. Uh, there have been some generic uh, shuffling with this clam a couple times. Um, but at least we do have many fossils from this genus. Um, of relevance here is the species Simatoya cookai which lived between 36 and 28,000 years ago in what was once the coastline of Baldwin Hills, Los Angeles County, California, which was originally 10 kilometers inland. And the Baldwin Hill mollusk fauna is only known about because a sewer line was being installed through what was soon discovered to be a 20 to 30 centimeter thick stratum that ended up providing fossilized evidence for up to 296 species of mollusks. So that was a really fantastic find, mm. um, as well as like like vertebrates and other invertebrates. Yeah. Um, so one of the team members in this study, Goddard, um, was surveying coastal species at Naples Point in Santa Barbara County when he came across a couple living clam specimens that were only about 10 millimeters long. This was back in 2018. And they were only photographed. And the following year, he returned and found another specimen, this time only 7.4 millimeters, and he took it in. And later that year, another was found, uh, only one half of a shell, 
and that was collected and that measured about 8.8 .8 millimeters long. So photos of all these specimens are presented here at the bottom of this slide. Mm. Now in comparing these specimens, the authors determined that they belong to the exact same species as the Pleistocene clams from Los Angeles County. So in other words, Simatoya cookai was not extinct, but had survived into the present day. Now, was there anything new that could be learned from these specimens? Honestly, not a whole lot. So yeah, these clams are small um, and they have a translucent shell, which is neat. You can kind of see this here on the left-hand images. Mm -hmm. um, and then they simply kind of burrow into the seabed. Um, now they may behave commensally like the other Galimatoid clams, but the team didn't fully survey the coastal community to be exactly sure. Um, one interesting observation though, is that curiously, the other members of the Baldwin Hills fauna, those that are already known to have represented living species anyway, were also found to coexist with this clam. Uh, various varieties of mussels, angel wings, and razor clams. Uh, but again, nothing can be said currently about how they interact with each other or how this community is related to the fossil remains back in the Pleistocene. But, you know, despite an 80-year gap between the fossil excavations and the rediscovery of this Lazarus taxon, um, the authors are pretty confident that more specimens will be found and then a proper study can begin. Hmm. But uh, it's kind of neat to see that even something like a clam uh, can represent a really fascinating example of the tenacity of species. Yeah. The fact that after all this time, these little clams have hung on through the ice ages mm -hmm. with many of their kin yeah. to be discovered by human beings. Um, what do you think, Albert? Oh, definitely. I, yeah, I, I don't have too much to add to the story, but it, it's pretty darn amazing. Um, clam, clams don't get them. Don't, don't get a lot of credit uh, much of the time, uh, but they, they definitely have some really fascinating natural histories, too. Oh, yeah, and there's certainly a lot that we could say about mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. all the mollusks, really. Um, but alas, we must move on, and we have ended with November, and now we come to our two final stories for December. And uh, Albert, once again, you have the floor. All right. Um, so this study is about uh, glass frogs. Um, so these are a group of uh, tree-dwelling frogs uh, from the American tropics. And uh, they are called glass frogs because they have a very special form of camouflage. Um, so the underside, the, the skin on the underside of their bodies, um, and also their muscles, are essentially transparent. So you can actually pick up a grass, glass frog, or uh, pro probably easier way to do it is if it's uh, lying on a piece of glass, you can lift the glass up and see through its belly uh, to its internal organs and its bones even. Uh, so that's really interesting. Uh, what, what, what good is this kind of, uh, this kind of strange uh, color pattern or lack thereof? Um, well, there was, a, there was a study that came out a few years ago investigating kind of the effectiveness of camouflage in, in glass frogs. And what they found was that uh, is essentially this is a really good way for them to kind of blend into uh, a background without having to match the background exactly. So the, the upper surface, so the, the back of, of a glass frog does have some pigmentation so it's usually like maybe a mottled uh, green color um, so when a f th these frogs when they're uh, kind of you know sleeping during the day they're usually lying on uh, the surface of a leaf or the underside of a leaf as the case might be um, and so they have this kind of greenish uh, back on top which helps them blend in but you know the thing is, you're not always going to match exactly every kind of leaf. This is where the kind of transparency comes in. So because the edges of the frog are, you know, transparent, um, this kind of blurs the outline of the frog relative to the surrounding leaf. And so it creates an illusion that the, the kind of pigmented part of the frog uh, kind of grades into the rest of the leaf. Um, in this way so the the transparency kind of blurs out the outline of the frog and you can see uh, on the uh, leftmost image here uh, how more or less how how this works you can see these uh, you, you can make out the frog sure in this uh, laboratory photo but out in the wild uh, 
you might have to work pretty hard to actually find these frogs in this state. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty interesting adaptation that they have. Now, there is one thing, however, that might compromise this camouflage, and that is the fact uh, that, like, you know, like the rest of us, uh, at least uh, among, uh, among most vertebrates, glass frogs have uh, blood with red blood cells in them and running throughout their bodies. And so having red blood cells uh, kind of running throughout your body means that if you're transparent, these red blood cells are going to show up like uh, through the transparent parts of your body and thus give you away when you're trying to remain hidden. Um, so the authors of this new study actually studied essentially how glass frogs maintain their camouflage while they are asleep, uh, despite having uh, you know, blood flowing through their bodies and potentially being visible to predators. And they found something rather unexpected and fascinating. Um, what they found was that when glass frogs are asleep, uh, they actually shove like 82 to 93% of their red blood cells into their liver um, and don't let it circulate throughout the rest of the bloodstream. Uh, so in this way, because the, the internal organs when you're, when you're viewing the frog from above uh, are hidden under the pigmented part of the back. And so the transparent part is, you know, it, it's no longer being given away by uh, the high density or concentration of, uh, of red blood cells uh, in the state. And they found that this was specifically when the, uh, when the glass frogs were sleeping. Uh, when the glass frogs had just exercised, as seen on the, uh, the rightmost image here, you can see that the blood is kind of flowing throughout the body, and so the frog becomes a lot more visible. Uh, but very quickly, they are able to kind of shove most of that blood into the liver and thus create a sort of uh, much more cryptic, uh, much more hidden uh, condition. And furthermore, they found that if they you know, gave, gave, the, uh, gave the frogs an anesthetic, um, they would lose this ability to kind of shove the blood into the liver. Uh, so this is, uh, this is something that their body is actively regulating. Um, so uh, that's pretty interesting. So there, there's definitely a sort of active mechanism going on here that allows them to kind of shunt uh, most of the red blood cells into the internal organs. Now, how did this ability evolve? Uh, the authors point out that previous studies have shown that there are other species of frogs that are known to store red blood cells in the liver while they're inactive. So some, um, some frogs, when they're hibernating, for example, will, will actually uh, store red blood cells in the liver uh, because they, they, during that state, they, they don't need blood circulating the rest of the body. Uh, so might as well just save it and put it, put it in the liver. Um, and they, they also observed other types of frogs that don't have transparent um, kind of uh, camouflage uh, doing this when they're inactive. But that being said, in these other examples, they don't put as many red blood cells, uh, as high a proportion of the red blood cells into the liver as the glass frogs do. So the, the glass frogs basically have a very extreme kind of uh, a form of this adaptation. So this study, um, or these, these findings, they don't only teach us something really cool and interesting about glass frogs, but uh, the authors also point out that it may facilitate future research and treatment of vascular diseases in humans, because if we tried to pack uh, 80 to 90 percent of our red blood cells into one tiny location in our bodies, um, that is very likely to cause blood clots, which can be deadly uh, when they happen in your internal organs. Um, and so uh, if we can figure out how glass frogs are able to pack so many red blood cells into a tiny location in their bodies uh, without suffering kind of the medical consequences, uh, this may be very helpful in uh, kind of improving uh, quality of life for humans as well. So uh, yeah, um, this, was a, this was definitely, I, I thought, a really interesting study. Uh, what about you? Yeah, I'm kind of floored by this, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, it's very surprising because, yeah, like a blood clot, like, thank, thank goodness I, I, I haven't really had many of them mm. at all, but like, that hurts. Mm. So like, to think about frogs actively doing this while they sleep, um, it's like, you have to wonder like what that must feel like. Right, because, yeah. Um, I guess it works out and they're used to it because it, just judging from the images, 
here from the paper, mm -hmm. it looks incredibly effective. Yeah. Like, it just looks like a, a leaf has some weird spots on it. Right. But there's a whole frog behind it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, glass frogs in and of themselves are already fascinating yeah. animals to begin with. But this just adds to the cake. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm very curious, like, how many other of the species do this sort of thing. Right. Because it was just one, you said, That's right? That's right, the yeah. The Fleischmann's uh, species. So I wonder how common this behavior is. Mm -hmm. um, certainly it would be worthy of extra study. Um, that is incredible, though. That is fascinating. Um, yeah, and certainly, like, if that could be applied to human research, that would certainly go a long way. Um, yet another example of how understanding the natural world can also help us benefit ourselves mm -hmm. in, in many ways. For sure. That's a great study. I like that a lot. <laughs> um, so I think now uh, we'll come to my December story mm -hmm. and our last story for today. And uh, I think it's fair to say that this is probably one of the most significant papers in, of the past year mm -hmm. in terms of the implications of future research. Yeah. Um, so environmental DNA, or eDNA for short, is the accumulation of DNA samples that is recovered from collections of soil, water, air particles, you name it. Organisms, including plants and animals, are frequently shedding their parts into their surroundings, um, losing skin cells, bits of hair, grasses and leaves may be shaved off during foraging, um, animals may spit or go number two. Hmm. Either way, DNA is being spread in all directions in various ways. And when conditions are right, the DNA that is lost can be preserved. And pioneering work in just the last few years has resulted in scientists being able to extract samples from various environments around the world and recover significant amounts of leftover DNA to show what types of organisms had been living or at least passed through that region. And what exciting extension of this research is its use in paleontology. There are now several studies where people have been able to extract DNA from marine sediments or from the floors of caves to see if any living or extinct plant and animals can be detected there. And so this massive study by Kurt H. Kyer and colleagues attempted to sequence environmental DNA from a site in northern Greenland called the Cap uh, Kjobenhav Formation uh, from a sliver of approximately 2 million year old sediments, so during the early Pleistocene epoch, and thus in the beginning stages of the Quaternary Ice Age that is so well known. Now, the reason we're talking about this here right now is, you guessed it, their attempts were successful. <laughs> it was a very surprising and significant discovery that the mineral particles in the Greenland soil were able to bind the DNA to themselves and preserve it for some 2 million years. This means that at the time of this recording now, these are the oldest ancient DNA samples yet known yep. at around a million years earlier than the previous record holders. That was DNA from a mammoth molar that was published in 2021. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely remarkable and has many implications about other areas of the world where conditions may have been similar enough to save DNA for such a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the key thing here for this eDNA study was for the team to reconstruct the ancient environment itself. And thankfully, the samples were so extensive that they were able to do just that. Because even if the ancient DNA samples were not always you know, exact when compared with living DNA samples, which is how this research usually works, they should still have enough similarities to make reasonably accurate predictions mm -hmm. about what was living here. And so what did they find? Um, let's start with the plants, and then we'll build up the biome they produce, and then examine the animal life. So the team uncovered a number of plant species which still grow in Greenland, but now in the more southerly reaches, as the area housing the formation is a polar desert with barely anything there. Um, these include willows, avens, members of the genus Vicinium, so that includes things like cranberries and blueberries, birch trees, sedges, and horsetails. Now, other plants recovered no longer grow in Greenland, 
but are common species in the northern boreal forests of North America and Eurasia. Mainly spruce, poplar trees, yews, hawthorns, thujas, and members of the genus Philopendula, which today include things like meadowsweet and the queen of the prairie. Now, alongside the DNA, the team also recovered pollen from various herbs that grow in upland environments, as well as lycopods. And comparing all of the species that were detected, fascinatingly, only 39 of these plants were previously known from recovered fossils. DNA was found from 63 species that were not known to have existed in the formation, which goes to show you how big some of the biases in the fossil record can be, depending on how the conditions were preserved in the past. So essentially, this assortment of plants reveals an open boreal forest, primarily dominated by birches, poplars, and thuja trees, interspersed with conifers, with an undergrowth of shrubby, herby, and weedy plants. But what is notable about this is that the mix of species itself is seen nowhere on Earth. There is no habitat anywhere today that has such a variety of both boreal and arctic species in this way. And many of these plants require temperatures to grow that are just not found in this part of Greenland today. So ergo, what we have is an ecosystem with no modern analogs at a time when Greenland was actually warmer than it is today, even accounting for the fact that the Quaternary Ice Age was just starting. So, okay, what about the animals? Do they also confirm this model? And indeed so. The team did not find much animal DNA as they did plant DNA, and in most cases they could only identify the creatures to their larger clades, or what a Linnaean would call the family level. Mm. But it was enough to reveal some interesting things. Uh, this ecosystem supported mastodons, the now extinct distant relatives of the elephant. Um, but in comparison to the mastodon DNA that we already have, for there's a couple, this appeared to be an early diverging population. And the same scenario unfolded for the reindeer, aka caribou DNA, that was also uncovered. So these two may represent more ancestral populations of later species. Now, other mammalian DNA included arctic hares and what is probably a type of lemming or bull. Um, and the team also found their fleas, funnily enough, alongside wood ants of the genus Formica, which is very common today. Now, birds were only represented by what the team seemed robustly sure are a type of black goose that is of the genus Branta. Now, at the moment, this seems to support a mainly arctic fauna by itself, but the team also recovered DNA from marine organisms of a sort that is mainly found in much warmer waters of many degrees Celsius than is found in Greenland today. Um, these included horseshoe crabs, which is uh, probably the Atlantic species, um, as well as a type of reef-building stony coral of the Crade Mirulindidae, as well as varieties of different plankton and algae, like things like diatoms. Mm. Um, now, to be clear, that's not to say that this open boreal forest was right next to the seashore. Uh, the team suggests that these are the remains of marine animals and plants that washed into a local river system, which then mixed them with the land animal and plant samples. But still, like, there's a close connection there, and that is intriguing. So in total, around 2 million years ago, northern Greenland supported a diverse boreal forest community of what is today considered arctic and boreal species of plants and animals in a climate that was warmer than today, with surface sea temperature of at least 8 degrees Celsius warmer as well. Now, this is big on a number of fronts. Previous studies of the fossil record here in this formation are going to now need to be reassessed because the presence of mastodons and reindeer suggests that the ecosystem had a higher productivity than was earlier suggested. Not to mention that the team also found so many species of plants that were not known to have existed in the fossil record here before. Indeed, this environment is something new altogether. We have no frame of reference for it in the world today. And in all fairness, that should be expected. I mean, that's just evolution in action. And the same goes for ecosystems as well. 
but the presence of such a relatively warm environment and climate here in Greenland at least tracks with previous understandings of the Ice Age cycles. Mm -hmm. Now, the glacial periods were far shorter and more frequent in the early Pleistocene than in the later Pleistocene. They averaged about 41,000 years. So there wouldn't have been much time for extensive ice sheets to form in places like this, where in later ice ages, that would have just been mowed over by ice. Mm. Um, and, you know, because of this, that would have allowed so many plants and animals to migrate and spread their populations this far north. As you can see on the map here, we're, we're in the Arctic Circle pretty much. Mm -hmm. And that gives us such a unique and rich environment as revealed in this study. So... If all this information can be gleaned from just one ancient environmental DNA study, I mean, think about what's in store for us in the future. Mm -hmm. you know, where else can we find such rich details as this that the fossil record can only give us just a peak, in a sense? Mm -hmm. um, so I was really moved by this study. And like seeing some of the interviews by some of the researchers, they were pretty moved as well. Mm -hmm. um, they mentioned that there's two types of papers. There's the foundational papers and there's everything afterwards <laughs> that builds on that. Yeah. And this is definitely a foundational mm -hmm. paper. Mm -hmm. And I cannot wait to see where this is going to go. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Albert. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible. Um, just, just having the oldest recorded DNA alone is a huge deal, but the fact that they were able to kind of glean so many details about this ancient ecosystem with this method. Yeah, that's, that's just, uh, that's just amazing. And it certainly opens up a whole new world to explore, just like you said. Um, so I, I too can't wait to see uh, what other locations people um, study using this method. Um, so yeah, uh, really, really nice to see eDNA getting its dues, considering uh, we received uh, uh, a notable question about it back when we did the interview with um, uh, uh, Miles and Trey, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, and really, like, this is so cutting edge that I imagine like a year from now, if even then, mm -hmm. like, there's going to be major advancements. And certainly there are areas that you know could be improved because mm -hmm. again um when it came to identifying plant species by the eDNA that was an easier time than the animal remains right um like for most of them it's just the barest hints of what they were like oh this is a hare this is a mastodon um like the team were able to make like even more specific identifications only through a process of elimination like, like for the hair DNA, like, okay, the only hair that lives in this part of the world is the Arctic hair. Right. So it's probably that one. Oh, hey, we found a horseshoe crabs. <laughs> well, we know about the Atlantic horseshoe crab. That's probably what this is. Um, but for all we know, like these could be completely new species um, or at least like extinct populations mm -hmm. of currently existing species yeah. mm -hmm. that often ancient DNA has found for, for many swaths of the tree of life. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of work to hone in that technique. So that way, when we get animal DNA, we can be a little bit more confident with some of these IDs. Um, but I mean, again, just the fact that they built this entire ecosystem from scratch with so much detail compared to like what the fossil record had. Um, it really like makes you think about a lot of things. Yeah. Like even going even deeper into time, you know, we have many sites in the Mesozoic and in the Paleozoic, for example, that have a rich preservation of many organisms. But, you know, who knows what we're missing from there, you know, especially in those little windows of time. It's, uh, it's cool. It, it really makes me further appreciate paleontology as a science. Mm -hmm. and, and in the new millennium, you know, what has been done with the field, so many um, breakthroughs and new technologies that just make this feel all the more fascinating to me. Um, it's really, it's really amazing, really amazing. Big kudos to the whole team and congratulations to all of them for this achievement. Um, I know there's a Nova special that came out about it mm. that I must have missed, but I'll have to check that out for sure because yeah. I'd love to see like the footage as the team was, was doing this because uh, I understand it's there um, and just to get all their reactions, ugh, it'd be great. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, so that is it for our 2022 roundup. Um, we want to thank you all for joining us. And uh, I certainly had fun picking these stories, and I'm sure you did too, buddy. Mm -hmm. And uh, But with that, that is the end of our show. So we'll go on now to our usual goodbyes and things. Um, we are on Patreon. If you are interested in supporting us with any sort of monetary donation, you can go to patreon.com forward slash time and clades where your contributions will help us continue this series and develop new projects and expansions as well as work on the series that we already have um a little bit of shuffling this time around for our patreons but uh we want to welcome and thank our, our new patron uh frankish so thank you for joining in welcome to the show um we also want to give shout outs to denver and paul for their contributions to the series we appreciate it very much um, on to general acknowledgments. Um, music for our series is made by our friend Henry, and the color scheme for Albert's Alversor avatar is by his good friend Alicia Hutchinson. So I want to thank you both for that. Um, we are on Twitter. So if you want to see updates where we generally post new episodes when they air, you can go to at Time and Clades. Uh, but most likely you are watching us on our YouTube page through Time and Clades. So feel free to like and subscribe if you are interested. Um, if you have any questions for us about the show, whether about the studies that we covered or just anything in general, you are welcome to email us, timeandclades at gmail.com, or you can message us on our YouTube comment section or on our Twitter page as well, and we will almost certainly get those. Now, if you're interested in reading any of the papers that we have for our episode today, we will provide uh, links in the description for the various references used as well as any other links or videos or books that we want to share, you can find those there as well. Uh, and with that, that is it. Um, let's see, we're in the new year, it's 2023. Um, certainly going to be plenty of new and exciting discoveries to talk about in the next upcoming year, mm -hmm. as well as what will be our third year anniversary, no doubt, which is uh, just so exciting that we've gotten this far. <laughs> um, now, of course, we, we've been fairly busy and, and preoccupied with things over the last couple of months mm -hmm. so at the moment we don't really have any announcements for upcoming shows yet um again i do regret to say that the the, the episode that i'm working on uh is still in development mm -hmm. um but hopefully that should be out in the near future um but otherwise that is really it for us um well, thank you all for joining us again and uh until next time yeah take care everybody <laughs>